You've got to start from the beginning of the interaction because a lot of the influences uh, uh, from that beginning carried through. The influences of the volume of alcohol that was poured into this country, the volume of weapons that was poured into the country. This was the genesis of casual killings. This was the genesis of irresponsible governance because a lot of the coastal chiefs who if they were sober, would not engage in the trade. They were plied with full strength alcohol. When I was in, uh, I make you laugh, when I was in, uh, on a tour of the Caribbean, not a Caribbean cruise, we went to some of these rum factories and you were able to sample, because I had read that the, the strength of the rum that was being supplied to these uh, coastal peoples was 80% well, proof. 80%? 80%. So wow. while I was in the Caribbean, I, I had the opportunity to sample uh, a rum of 80%. My goodness, just a little sip of the thing, your ears immediately on fire, your, uh, there was sensation in your ankles. Wow. So you can imagine that it was like opium as it damaged the people of Hong Kong and South China that was forced upon them. The alcohol absolutely debilitated our people such that the, uh, the society then becomes dysfunctional. Imagine the people who were fearful of their own gods, they lived in Maria, etc. And all of a sudden, this full strength, high strength poison. I argue that, I mean, this thing about, so, um, our people, if, if our people had not been involved in selling their own brothers, nothing would have happened. So you argue that that's not, a, that's not accurate. Yes. You argue that they were manipulated, right? Mm hmm they were coerced to get into the business. Absolutely. That's your argument. Absolutely. I mean, it's a nonsense uh, narrative that was spun that we ran with because we had not done our own research. Well, what became interesting that was that when abolition came and the book explains the real reasons for abolition, that it wasn't a change of hearts. It was a change of thinking. And it was a change of thinking forced upon the slavers by the Africans who had revolted in particular in Haiti. It was the Haitian revolution that now made it clear that they can't sustain the trade any longer. And that's when they started thinking of abolition. And in the course of the abolition debates, because they didn't, some, the, the, those who were profiting from the system, because any political system has winners and losers, those who were profiting from the system weren't going to roll over and say, you take my daily bread away. They were resisting, they were holding on. And so the arguments in parliament were actually very revealing. One side arguing that it's evil, it's got to go, etc. The other one says, no, 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 we need it, it must continue, etc. And in the course of those exchanges, evidence spills out as to how the trade was really being instigated. And I remember one of the, uh, um, one of the prime ministers who said that, it is we who are instigating the trade. It is we who have the demand. It is we who supply the weapons for them to go and fight other groups and capture them and in order to supply our needs. You, you, you connect the transatlantic slave trade story to colonialism. Yes. Can you explain yes. the connection? People often say, well, you, you, you talk a lot about uh, transatlantic slave trade, but you don't say so much about the trans-Saharan one, which was older, it preceded the transatlantic, and it was in, it arguably in volume bigger. My explanation to them is that the reason why the transatlantic one is dominant in the narrative, partly because it was much more inhuman, the level of inhumanity was so much greater. But the second aspect, vital aspect, is that it preceded and led to colonization because these unfortunates were not being taken to Britain. They were being taken to islands in the Caribbean America, that right. had been taken off the indigenous peoples in those lands. And then even when abolition came, uh, what was the next move? Because at the end of the American War of Independence, 
both sides, the British and the American settlers, had enlisted the enslaved Africans to fight for them, each giving them the promise, fight for us, when we win, we will free you. Free. So at the end of the war, there was a huge pool of Africans who were now trained in the forbidden way. Forbidden in the sense that the essence of the slave trade was that you don't teach the Africans how to use weapons. Now for their own short-term interests, they had trained this large body of Africans in the use of weapons who had now had experience in killing whites, white slavers, etc. So they weren't going to keep them around. What did they then decide to do? They decided to export them. Where to? Back to Africa. So this is how Sierra Leone was created as a first colony for the British. 1808. 1808. And the uh, Liberia was created uh, by the Americans. But the Americans stopped there. They already had the expanse of America to digest, and they were busy digesting that. The British, having lost America now, saw Sierra Leone as the launch pad, stepping stone for the colonization of the whole of West Africa. And the French now joined them in the race. So you see how there was an immediate uh, transition from slavery, abolition, colonization to Nigeria. The story of Nigeria. Yeah. That's the story of Nigeria. That is, that is our story. And there uh, is no point just to the extent that we say we have some knowledge of Nigeria's story. We start in 1900. No, you can't you start there. You start in 1900. Oh, uh, Most people start in 1960. Oh, look at, look at that. <laughs> and then a few others start from 1940. Amazing. The amalgamation of Nigeria. Amazing. Very few people start beyond, I mean, before 1914. You, you've, it, it's, you've got to start from the beginning of the interaction because a lot of the influences uh, uh, from that beginning carried fruit. The influences of the volume of alcohol that was poured into this country, the volume of weapons that was poured into the country. This was the genesis of casual killings. This was the genesis of irresponsible governance because a lot of the coastal chiefs who, if they were sober, would not engage in the trade. They were plied with full strength alcohol. When I was in, uh, I'll make you laugh, when I was in, uh, on a tour of the Caribbean, not a Caribbean cruise, we went to some of these rum factories and you were able to sample, because I had read that the, the strength of the rum that was being supplied to these uh, coastal peoples was 80% well, like proof. 80%? 80%. So wow. while I was in the Caribbean, I, I had the opportunity to sample uh, a rum of 80%. My goodness. Just a little sip of the thing, your ears immediately on fire, your, uh, there was sensation in your ankles. Wow. So you can imagine that it was like opium as it damaged the people of Hong Kong and South China that was forced upon them. The alcohol absolutely debilitated our people such that the, the society then becomes dysfunctional. Imagine the people who were fearful of their own gods, they lived in Maria, etc. And all of a sudden, this full strength, high strength poison is being poured in. Mm. That's when things begin to fall apart. Mm. Wow. Ah.